I love that song. Hi, everybody. This is super exciting. And welcome to the joy of optimizing. Um, this talk is about making happy little pixels. The littler, the better. And it was inspired by this man. If you're unfamiliar, Bob Ross is a really famous oil painter and TV show host from the 80s, and he does incredibly inspiring work. So when preparing for this presentation, I tried to put myself in the shoes of Bob Ross. <laughs> Didn't really work. Um, I have like a weird like beard. Like this is a literal neck beard. I gave myself a literal neck beard. Uh, so more, <laughs> more accurately, this is who I am on the internet. I work at DigitalOcean as a UI engineer. Um, I started a couple of meetups, the SAS meetup in DC and then Austin, Texas when I moved. And this is really how I got started in development. Um, the community here in Perth is so awesome, the collaborative meetup community. I was at Collide the other day and I was really impressed. So I kind of want to give a round of applause to all the meetup and conference organizers here. Yeah. Y'all are awesome. Y'all are great. Um, so again, Tools Day is the podcast that I record. If you're interested, it's toolsday.io. I think it's pretty cool, but you know, it's up to you. So this talk is all about images on the web. And we're going to look at that from a couple perspectives. First, we're going to look at the problem with images on the web, understanding why we got to where we are. Uh, then we're going to talk about the medium, so the images themselves, the paint, the canvas, what's coming next. Um, solutions, so everything from automatic solutions to semi-automatic to manual about how to improve your own websites, and then example time. I don't know what to put here, so I put yay. Yay! So how did we get to where we are today? Um, it all has to do with the technology that we have. So here is a graph of camera ownership over time. And the gray and blue are cameras, from everything from DSLR to um, single shoot cameras. Um, and as we can see, that recently has decreased, but this yellow has increased exponentially, and those are smartphones. And the best camera is really the one that you have with you. So now we're here. Like, this is where we are. <laughs> no? Now cameras that we have with us take 12 megapixel photos. That's the iPhone 7 spec. That's giant. It's led us to this place of irresponsible imaging. We're at this phase now where we can send images without really thinking about the repercussions. And the repercussions are this. This is what we're doing to our users with irresponsible imaging. And more accurately, we're doing this. <laughs> so what? You know, devices will catch up, technology will catch up. Let's look at some new fun facts. So Google did a study last month, September of 2016, where they surveyed over 10,000 mobile devices on 3G. And um, we're going to play a little game, so I hope that you're excited for that. It's called fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. The average load time that they found in the study for mobile websites is how many seconds over 3G? Call it out. 15, 8, 45, maybe here, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so they, it was 19 seconds. That's like crazy fans. I know the first one is 15. That was pretty close. I was impressed. Um, 19 seconds for the average load time of a mobile site over 3G. They also found that mobile sites that loaded within five seconds versus the average of 19 had what percent longer sessions? Percentages. 60. That was a good guess. 200. <laughs> it's 70. <laughs> And then the last one, what percent of visits to mobile sites were abandoned after three seconds? So we didn't even get to the five. We didn't get to the 19. We're, we're at three seconds. 40? 90? No, not 90. Um, 53. So over half of those sessions, this is what we're doing to people on the web. Another really interesting fact is to look at the emerging web community. As of 2014, India was the third largest online market with more than 198 million internet users. That is a huge number. That is a staggering number. And that number is just continuing to grow and grow. And now if we take that idea and compare it to this, it's kind of interesting to see how those correlate. So this is average connection speeds across the world on the internet. Start with the United States, um, pretty decent connection, definitely not the fastest in the world. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, average peak connection speed is 57.3 megabits per second. Let's compare that to Australia, where sometimes the internet is a little hard to use. <laughs> okay, so 41.9 at the average peak and 7.8 at the average overall connection speed. But now let's compare that to India again. 
That is so much dramatically slower than what we experience. And they are the third largest online consumer of the web today. So back to the brilliant Bob Ross. You can have anything you want in the world once you help everyone get what they want. What a genius. He's such an inspiration. <laughs> HTTP Archive does a every um, bi-monthly data archive of the average website today. And right now, the average website is 2509 kilobytes big, with images taking up 1624 of those. 1,600, whatever, 1624. 64% um, <laughs> of those are images. That's huge. That's why I want to talk about images today, because it's where we can make such a big impact. In fact, the average single JPEG is 2.3 times bigger than the average JavaScript file. And people are constantly arguing about whether to include jQuery or not on a website because of the performance usage. No, you can take out one image. You can take out half of one image and have all the jQuery you want. I'm not saying do that, but <laughs> you get what I'm saying here. So let's go into understanding our canvas. Whew, there's so many image formats. This is like 23 out of 70 and doesn't even include a lot of the ones I'm talking about in this in this conversation. Um, but the big problem is that every platform uses a different format inherently. If we look at emojis, just emoji alone, um, on a Mac, you're using a format called SBIX, which is extended BMP. Android uses traditional BMP. Um, on Windows, there is a format called color, C-O-L-R. And yet, that's just these shapes. And it causes all these problems. Like, I couldn't scale these any higher if I wanted to use the actual emoji, because they don't exist. Like, an image size at like 144 pixels just doesn't exist for these emojis. Um, so now let's take a look at some of my happy little tree artwork. Beautiful. With different images, you want to use different formats. Um, and the reason why is because the compression algorithms that generate these images are varying. They vary in how they work. So examples like SVG, GIF, PNG, they're better suited for larger blocks of single colors, whereas something like a JPEG is better suited for raster images where a lot of colors are grading and changing and flowing into each other. So let's briefly talk about these image formats and then introduce some new ones. I'm going to talk about GIF, PNG, JPEG. We're all familiar with these, right? Um, then there's WebP. I'm going to talk about two new ones called BPG and FLIF, which are really exciting. But let's start with the GIF. The GIF with a G. Um, so the GIF is an 8-bit color format, which means that you get 256 colors in addition to the raw image data stored in that image and displayed at any time. It doesn't have transparency support, but it does have dithering support. And you can control the amount of dithering and the type of dithering. What dithering is, is an addition of noise to reduce um, distortion on the image itself. And it looks like this. This is a noise dithering. The thing about dithering is it also affects image size. So if we take a look at this example, this is a noise dithered image. It's about 77 kilobytes. Um, and then we can also do this like pattern dither. It's a different type of dither. It reduces the image size. But I think the pattern dither reminds me of like cross stitch a little bit. It's cool. Now, now that you know the two different types, you'll kind of see it everywhere. Um, but now, what about the PNG? The PNG is awesome because it's an open source reaction to the GIF threatening to license. There's a little fun fact for you. And the PNG comes in two variants, so it also has a 256 color variant and a 24 color variant, a 24 bit variant, which is true color, and that means 16 million colors across the spectrum. Now, because of the better compression of a PNG, it's usually better, it's always better, to use a 8 bit PNG than a GIF, unless you're trying to animate. But we'll get into that in a second. It also has alpha transparency, and it uses delta encoding. That is that compression algorithm. So PNGs are lossless. Um, it means that it doesn't lose quality when you save the image. And it uses this delta compression, which means that it's taking the difference of one pixel to another and um, sort of looking for areas that have similar colors. Areas that have similar colors will be zero in the differences, right? So that means that when it saves to disk, you're decreasing that file size. That's why in that first example of all those trees, it's better to use those um, large areas of color, not have that raster image change, because it will have to keep writing that change on the disk. Whereas a JPEG looks at all the differences of the pixels, it's always going to discard data, and will always decrease the image quality. So even if you save a JPEG at 100% quality, you're going to be losing some of the data on that JPEG. If you've ever looked behind the scenes, it looks like this. 
Um, in the PNG, there's going to be these empty spaces, and that's where the values are corresponding to the values next to them. It's like the difference between those pixels, whereas the JPEG is going to look at all this data and rewrite it at all times. I know this looks crazy, but JPEG is super, super smart, so I think it's like, really cool to see what's going on behind the scenes there. Um, basically, you're going through a several-step process for compression. You're starting with the channels, you're breaking those channels up into chromas, and then you're taking an 8 by 8 pixel grid, always an 8 by 8 pixel grid with JPEG. Um, you're going through another transformation, and then you do quantization. And quantization is using um, a quantization table based on the quality that you're setting in the JPEG when you save that JPEG. So it goes through that. It does this really cool zigzag pattern to determine what values it's going to keep, what it's going to discard, um, and then goes through a few other optimizations to resave the image and save space on our servers. So lossy images aren't a bad thing. They're great for performance. If we look at the breakdown of that, on smaller image sizes, you really can't tell much of a difference in quality. So like the 10%, there is some artifacting and banding in the sky, but it's kind of hard to see. Um, the big change here is the file size. Like, that is quite the difference. When you look at the histogram, so the colors that are involved in this image, in the compression at 10%, you can see that there are lines that go through it. You still save the color data of the um, sort of extremes, but you get rid of a lot of the information in between, so the transition colors. And that's what causes that artifacting and banding of your images. So if you zoom in closely, you might be able to see here a little bit of that. In the 10% image, it's sort of blocky. You can see the difference in very sharp shapes um, in this image. So 80% quality is probably a good medium. It'll save you a bit of data when you're sending that to your users. Honestly, 60 to 70 is usually OK. When I was doing this research, I found many, many JPEG types. These two kept popping up specifically. JPEG 2000, JPEG XR, these now have lossless compression as well as lossy. Um, their compression algorithms have been revised. They're a little bit better. But <laughs> According to jpeg.org, there are like six different types of JPEGs to use. So while people are complaining about that there are too many JavaScript frameworks, let's just take a look at this. The reason I'm not going to get into this too much is because if you look at the support tables, with JPEG 2000, it's really only supported by Safari, um, and JPEG XR is really only supported by IE and Edge. So what the internet is saying is, for IE and Edge, use JPEG XR. For Safari, use JPEG 2000. For Chrome, just no JPEG, we're going to use WebP. Welcome to the web in 2016. So why isn't Chrome using JPEG? What's wrong with JPEG? Nothing. JPEG is great. It's brilliant. But it's old. And there are so many improvements that we can make upon it. So WebP is probably the most promising new image format that we have today. It was initially developed by ON2 and then Google took over, so it's a really big Google initiative now since 2010. And it supports lossier lossless compression. There's an animation component that you can include. Um, and it has a better compression algorithm than JPEG. That was the initial focus of WebP. But um, it also supports alpha transparency. So it is comparable and faster than PNG in many cases. And with this lossless compression, WebP is often saving you 30% in your image savings. Um, so that's pretty, pretty cool to see. The way that WebP works is through predictive coding. Um, basically, predictive coding uses values in neighboring blocks of pixels to predict the values of that block and then only encode the difference. This is what a lot of the newer image formats are using. And it's really inspired by video. If you take a look at the histogram here, the change, this is a TIFF compared to a WebP. You'll see how this compresses differently. You see these white even lines throughout. And then compare that to a 60% saved JPEG. There's a lot greater savings because you're just getting rid of this even amount of data. So if we look at support for WebP, um, the support isn't fully there yet. But it's really promising because Safari and Firefox are both experimenting with it right now. And that's saying a lot based on all of these differences, trying to get people to agree on image formats. So that's why this is probably the most um, promising image format that you can start experimenting with today. So if you want to convert to WebP, there are a variety of options. I'll be sharing this slide deck so you don't have to like, try to take a picture here. Um, but Basically, you can use a Photoshop plugin, you can use the command line tools, you can use web tools. I personally like the command line because it's quick and easy to represent fast. 
So if you have Homebrew installed, you can then brew install these two programs called Image Magic, and then you can install WebP. Once you have that installed, in one line of code, you can use Mogrify, which is a function that Image Magic gives you, um, and just in the folder containing all your files, convert everything to WebP, say from JPEG. If you're going to use WebP, there is a polyfill called WebPJS, and the polyfill is 67 kilobytes big itself. So if your savings are greater than 67 kilobytes, this could be something that you're considering. If you feel weird about using um, a polyfill to serve your images, don't do this yet. But it is a promising format that's coming out. So Similar to WebP, there is a new video format called WebM. And again, Google took over the development of this from a few different companies that were initially developing it. And WebM has pretty good support. So Edge is supporting it, Firefox, Chrome, um, basically everything but IE. An example of converting it is just through this online converter that I use pretty often. And it gives you really big savings. Like This has saved this video over half from the MP4 version. The cool thing about WebM is that you don't need a polyfill, because with video, you can inherently send various sources. So you can do this right now. Save your um, videos as WebM. If the codec supports it on the browser, then your audience will get that faster, smaller image. So more options, more power. Now let's talk about some of those experimental formats. Also, you could tell that this is a pattern diffusion GIF. <laughs> you know, the more you know. So uh, there's two I want to talk about. BPG is called Better Portable Graphics. And um, this came out in 2014. It seemed really promising at first. And the purpose of it was to replace JPEG. So here you can see that different tests show that it was smaller than JPEG, JPEG XR, which is smaller than JPEG, and WebP, according to the BPG website. Um, it has a higher compression, so files are similar. The, the files that are similar, they look better, first of all, in smaller image sizes, and they are smaller in size. So again, this is using that idea of the differences between pixels, which is inspired by video, by the HEVC video formats. Um, alpha channels are also supported, but unfortunately, there appear to be no plans to support this in any browser, so I couldn't even find it on Can I Use. Maybe soon, it's so new. Um, but if you want to try this and start like playing with image formats, there's a web encoder and there's a polyfill, which is 56 kilobytes. So it's getting there. This is definitely a possibility for image formats that we'll see in the near future. There's also this image format called the FLIF, or FLIF, the Free Lossless Image Format. And by the way, this is open source as well as the BPG format. Um, so this is kind of like the newest kid on the block. And on their website, they claim to be smaller than literally everything I mentioned in this presentation. They did a lot of um, sort of corpus studies on images and rendering the FLI FLIF FLIF versus other image formats. And here's an image of that. So the brown and the red at the bottom show that at different compressions, the size of the FLIF was smaller than JPEGs, um, BPGs, and PNGs. The other cool thing about FLIFs is that they work with responsive images. So an FLIF, FLIF I cannot say this for the life of me, um, it can be loaded in different variations within the same source file. That means that the browser can start rendering this image no matter what before it figures out how much detail will need to be rendered and make adjustments ahead of time. So instead of having to use something like the picture element with various sources, you can just use the FLIF, embed it in different ways, I don't know if you can read the highlighted text, but it shows you that you can, through this command line or through a system, embed it, and then send that with various um, variations on the quality. So the polyfill status, unfortunately, is beta, not tested on all browsers. Performance and size is still being optimized. But I did link to the polyfill if you want to check it out. Back to Bob Ross. That's so many things, um, I know. But this is 2016. Um, and in this is the dev world, like that's, that's where we are today. Um, so I think it's a really good thing. The fact that we have all these various image formats, the best one will win. But let's take a look at some things that we should definitely be doing today. And those are some solutions and pro tips about how to improve the image formats that we have now. So the first thing that we can do is just totally automate our images. And when I think of automation, I think of image magic. It's like this little magic wizard. Um, you can use Image Magic in a variety of formats in whatever way your development environment is set up. It's kind of like write it once and you're done. So with Webpack, there's something called Magic Loader. With Gulp, there's Gulp-GM, which is graphics magic, a very similar thing to Image Magic. 
Um, with Grunt, you have Grunt Image Magic, and then you can just write NPM scripts directly with your file system, and it's called Node Image Magic. It's like a wrapper. So if you want to use, say, Node Image Magic and write these directly, you can just have your input, your output, say I'm converting JPEGs to PNGs, I can set the quality. It's super, super, super customizable. Write it once, and you're good to go for all your files, wherever you're directing it. So there's also semi-automation. This is a section sort of about tools. As you could tell, I like tech tools. Um, but there's three tools that you can use to sort of semi-automate your images. The first one is called Image Alpha. And this allows for a lot of control over your images. So you can drag them in, see what they look like at different color dithering compressions, um, add the background for transparency. It's a great tool to have on your system. It's an awesome GUI. The next tool that you can use in concert with this is Image Optim. And this is actually my favorite of all because it's super magical. You like drag all your images and watch them just sort of turn smaller <laughs> before your eyes. Um, recently, this new project called Yarn came out. And while I didn't contribute to the development of the project, they put up a website. And I thought, maybe I'll help with some of the optimizations on the website. I just ran their images through Image Optim, didn't change the size, nothing like that. And it saved 200 kilobytes that they were sending to the user. So this is super, super powerful um, and really quick to do. Just have it on your system and run things through, and then you're good to go. The last one is called SVGO. And this is an online variant of SVGO called SVG OMG. And so you can, <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um, you can pull in your SVG images on that, and you have a few options on the sidebar about how you want to compress these things. All right, so now the manual compression. As Andy said, let's build a website. This huge yellow area is like kind of what's slowing down the page performance the most, probably. So there are a few different, like, fun pro tips about ways you can improve these images. All right, next game, spot the difference. Can anyone tell the difference here? File size, yes. They're the same physical dimension size um, and the same quality. OK, if this helps, it's like a little blend mode difference variation. Can you see that? The image that is smaller is blurred in the unimportant part in the ground area. So if you blur a JPEG, you can greatly decrease the file size because that quantization, when you're decreasing the um, little 8 by 8 pixel grids, it doesn't have as much work to do to sort of determine like, the changes between each of those areas. So blurring the JPEGs will greatly decrease that file size if you blur unimportant areas. And Blur is a really awesome tool in web development. So Medium, if you're familiar, renders images and includes them as like blurred placeholders until that image loads for the user to see. It animates in. And what they're doing is really decreasing the perceived performance, because they're giving this image a placeholder on the screen. So if we wanted to do that with this image that we've been using, it's 409 kilobytes. Um, if we save it down to a 30 pixel little icon, it's now less than one kilobyte. It's 533 bytes that we're sending. What we can then do is scale it up to its position. Um, blur it using CSS filters, SVG, any variety of means. And then when we're ready, once that image loads in, there we go. It's done. So Facebook uses a similar technique in their header, their cover photos. Um, and they have a sort of budget of 200 bytes. And the reason why is because Facebook uses GraphQL. And when they make queries from this database, if it's larger than 200 bytes, they have to go and send another request. So the fact that they're sending images so small means that they don't have to do another network request. It makes that initial load super, super fast. And then when it's ready, it animates in. So you can save time and data for your users by using this technique. It really improves perceived performance and initial load of your site. There's a similar thing called the progressive JPEG. Um, and if you've heard of these, it's a way that JPEGs load in layers, which is how like, the web originally had them. Um, so baseline will load from top to bottom, but progressive JPEGs will load with lower quality images and then increases the quality as it goes. So this also improves perceived performance, but it doesn't get as much of the actual performance benefit as using a blur technique like I showed earlier. If you want to use progressive images, which you should for your JPEGs, it's just a simple checkbox, a way to save the JPEGs out in, say, Photoshop. You can also run like a task for Photoshop to make this change. So embrace the blur. It's like a fun pro tip. What's the difference? Just kidding. Um, <laughs> this one's pretty obvious. So, Another fun fact about JPEGs is that color data is a really big part of what you're sending to your user. So you can lose a lot of sort of size and bulk when you're sending black and white images to your user. 
But black and white doesn't have to be boring. We can be really creative with this online. And a way to do that is through blend mode. So here I have this hard light blend mode that I've applied to this image. Um, and you can use a variety of means here, especially with color. When you're using blend modes, you can apply multiple gradients on a single plane and then use that to color the image behind it. You can get really creative with it. Um, I made this little open source project called CSSgram, which has um, sort of all the, not all, but several of the Instagram filters recreated in CSS. So you can kind of take this idea and apply it to your images. So I wanted to then benchmark what the impact of the additional paint of these blend modes would be versus the size of the image that you're saving that you're sending to your users. So what was that? I did a little test. I sent the colored image first, I sent the black and white image next, and then I sent the black and white image with a blend mode applied to it last in this last example. Ran them through web page tests and found that, not surprisingly, the black and white image loaded the fastest in about 2.04 seconds. Um, the colored image, though, loaded in 2.2 seconds, and that was still significantly faster than sending an image with the color data originally. So I thought that was really interesting to see that blend modes can like, measurably improve our performance. But what about if we pre-render this image in Photoshop, we won't have a repaint, send that to the user, um, and see what that savings is. So now we're looking at the difference between 115 kilobytes instead of the 190 kilobytes. Again, I found that sending a black and white image with a blend mode applied is still faster than sending a pre-designed colored image in Photoshop with only a single layer of image data that is colored. So that was pretty cool to see. Less colors, less problems. Let's talk about animated images. So recently, um, I was tasked to help rebuild the new digitalocean.com site. And a big part of that was improving the performance and accessibility of the site. On this homepage is a GIF that, after automatic optimizers, is still over 600 kilobytes big. So there's a closer look at what we're optimizing. I really wanted to get that GIF smaller to make sure that the image, that the whole website was able to load in under one megabyte on the initial load. So I was able to save 200 kilobytes by opening this in Photoshop, open the timeline, click through the frames, because a lot of these frames are identical. There's pauses in the GIF. So if you look through, you can find a few frames that have the exact same items on them, delete those, and then increase the time of the first frame to make sure that you're not actually changing the length of the GIF. So this technique, combined with changing some of the dithering and the colors, allowed me to save a ton of data on that image. So format the frames. It's like kind of fun to go through and click through and see what that GIF looks like behind the scenes. GIFs are really big, so there's got to be alternatives, right? There's APNG, there's the FLIF that I can't pronounce, um, there's BPG, like we mentioned, and there's MNG, but none of these have really caught on. The thing that I found that was most interesting in terms of GIF optimization was this thing called the GIF V by Imager. And this is really cool. So the GIF V isn't a true GIF, it stands for GIF video. It automatically converts anything with the file of GIF V on the site into either WebM or Web, I mean, yeah, WebM or MP4 based on the browser support. So the extension name is preserved, but you get a video out of that. And that greatly decreases the file size because you're not sending every individual frame. You're sending the differences. You're sending a video. And video autoplay is back in iOS 10. I don't know who's excited about this, but I am. Like, <laughs> this means that autoplaying videos and headers can now actually autoplay, because previously, after iOS like, 4, they removed that ability. So if your videos are silent, GIFV will work great. Those videos will play. Um, yeah, like header backgrounds. <laughs> Such a good GIF, I can't even. Um, yeah, so why is it better to use video than a GIF? It's because of how those two are compressed differently. So with GIF, as you saw, we save every single frame. That's called intra-frame compression. And you're sending that file to the server. So there's no lookups or preloading. It just shows the picture and runs through those frames. With the videos, you're encoding the differences between frames. So videos with more movement are actually a lot bigger than videos that are like somebody is still and like giving an interview. Um, so with videos, you get a formula. You're figuring out the differences between those frames. It's pre-rendering 
on your browser. Um, so that's a lot smaller of data to save than every single individual frame. That is inner frame compression. So now let's take a look at an example and do our own little painting. Do you know this website? It's beautiful. I love it. I spent so much time like, clicking through it. I was like, oh my god, these animations. Um, all right, so step one in figuring out how to decrease all these images, um, determine the greatest common denominator image size. So that's a term that I don't know, remember from like middle school math class. Basically, we want to click through and find what the greatest image size that we're sending is. Um, so here on the home page, I found that the speaker images were 540 pixels, but we're sending an image that is 1560 pixels big. So, okay, that was one area, but let's see what happens when we resize. When we resize this image, it still stays at that size. We're still sending the bigger image. Let's take a look at some of the other pages. So here I found that one of the pages sends a 660 one pixel image, still sending it at 5, 1560 pixels. And then I found this, which was the biggest possible size for a speaker image. Um, this is in the blog, if one of the speakers is featured in a blog. Um, so those are 780 pixels, and we're sending it at 1560 pixels. So the way to determine the greatest common denominator size of all these images is take that biggest image and um, divide it by what you're sending. So what we can do here then is resize all the images by 50% um, to get them to be the biggest size that they're going to be in their containing blocks. Two ways to do this, there's a Photoshop batch resize, and then there is Image Magic CLI tools. Which one do you think I'm going to use? These CLI tools. So fast. So just get in the folder that you can access these images in, write a script, send it through, and there you have the greatest common denominator image size. Now, the people who made this website didn't just throw these images in at that size, they heard this phrase, right? Save retina images at two times the size. That's because retina screens are, have the capability of rendering multiple pixels in a smaller space. This is the advice that we hear, but I kind of want to challenge this notion. So if we take a look on the, this side of the screen, um, that is the original website, and then saving it at that GCD size, we're saving a ton of data. We're now at 79 kilobytes. And you don't really see a big difference in image size, even on retina screens, on your own screen. If you don't really see a big difference on your retina, compu like, retina computer, your audience likely won't see a difference. And then if we save that at the largest size that this image is going to be sent at, we get even more savings. So you get 195% improvement in image sizes just from this one image by saving it at the largest size that is going to be sent down to the users on the server. And there's tons of places that we can make improvements. The beautiful staff here, we can make them all a little bit smaller on the web. Um, there's little icons here. So just doing the speaker photos alone gets us from 1.1 megabytes to 500 kilobytes of images that we're sending to the user. That's a 220% savings in image sizes, in data, and in what your user is waiting to load before they could see the site. So yeah, think about that in terms of render and memory. And then what we can do is think about the image format. If we wanted to sort of experiment with this a little bit, we can convert that to WebP. So the JPEGs of all these images are 500 kilobytes. The WebP conversion gets that down to 340 kilobytes, plus that 67 kilobytes for the polyfill. We're now at 407 kilobytes, which gives us a little bit more savings at 234%. So we can do a lot with just saving these images down into their containing boxes. Step three is to choose the best image quality. So if you're sending smaller icons, definitely decrease that quality because you won't notice a big difference. You can make a lot of savings if you have a lot of icons, a lot of users, a lot of information that's smaller. Compress those. Um, and then consider the picture element. If you do want to send large, beautiful retina images and you aren't really caring about um, making your site as super speedy as possible, the picture element is really well supported surprisingly, um, and it's something you can use today. The only thing that doesn't support it is Internet Explorer, but it's super, super useful. So basically, you can say at a larger screen size, send this two times resolution image. At the smaller screen sizes, you're not sending these massive photos to people on their mobile devices. So this is great to use. When you resize, you can see that the image size, the greatest common denominator size, is decreasing. So send a smaller image as well. Step four is profit. Like, seriously, literally. Um, Amazon did a, a extensive studies about performance, and they found that just one second of page slowdown could cost them $1.8 billion in sales. 
Like, I can't even imagine how much money that is. 1.8 billion. So just some quick tips of image optimization. You probably don't need to send an image larger than it needs to be. Um, be aware of emerging image formats. And then also use the right format for the job. So understand the pros and cons of each, understand what's coming out there, what you can use today. Compress your smaller images to low qualities because you don't need the high um, quality image that you're sending on the home page to be a small icon. Always run your images through an optimizer. This is like a always, always do this. You're always going to find savings that the human eye is not going to detect. You're going to make a huge difference by doing this. Small improvements are still improvements. This is something that is important to know. Um, even a little bit of improvement makes that total web size a little bit smaller. That's what I want to see. I want to see the size of the average website shrink a tiny little bit. That would be so great. And then educate the entire team. You're here, you're learning about these techniques, bring this back to your team and implement this in the projects that you're making for your clients. So find balance. Like while this talk is a little heavy handed on the optimization end, it's really about finding balance, about finding balance between automation, manual um, image compression, and getting the effect that you want to send to your users. I love this quote. It's one of my favorite. He's, he's brilliant. This is how I feel that the web should be in a weird way. Like, people shouldn't be obstructed by things and media to use your, the web and to get your content, right? The web should be free. It should be able to ebb and flow from one site to the other, access data whenever people want. Build happy little pixels to make happy little websites and happy users. Basically what I'm saying is build a better web. Um, that's what this all boils down to, a single principle, just to build a better web, to build a faster web, to build a web that's more accessible to people. Speed has a lot to do with accessibility. If your site can't load in a certain amount of time, people will leave it. They won't even get the chance to see your data. These small incremental changes can have a really, really big impact overall. So build something that people love. But more importantly, build something that people don't hate. Thank you.